Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Rise of Confidential AI, brought to you by the SNEA Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative. I'm Erin Farr, your moderator for today's discussion. I work for IBM and I serve as vice chair of the SNEA Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative. Today we have two excellent speakers. We have Parviz Paravi, Global CTO of Financial Services Industry Solutions at Intel. Hello, Parviz, how are you? Uh, hi, Erin, I'm doing very well and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. And we have Dr. Richard Searle, who is vice president of confidential computing at Fortanix. How are you, Richard? Yeah, I'm great. Thanks, Erin. Good to be with everybody today. Thanks. So first, a little bit about SNEA. The Storage Network Industry Association is a group of about 200 industry-leading organizations comprising of 2,500 active contributing members and 50,000 participating IT end users and storage experts worldwide. And... For those who aren't familiar, SNEA is a global not-for-profit association dedicated to advancing the adoption of technologies related to storage. We also provide an extensive range of educational materials, which can be found in the SNEA Educational Library. And just some logistics for today, you can ask questions during the presentation by selecting the Ask Question option and entering your question. And the slides are also available at the Attachment tab at the bottom of your console. And one last thing before we get started, uh, let's take a quick look at the SNEA legal notice. This provides SNEA's copyright notice regarding use of the material. SNEA is not providing any legal advice and there are no warranties expressed or implied. So if you want to reference this material, please do so at your own risk. And so welcome everyone to today's session on confidential AI. Today we will discuss that security is a business imperative. We'll talk about how to protect data and code in use and the need for confidential AI. And then we'll cover technology and use cases and real world case studies. And then we'll open it up for Q&A, but obviously you can also ask questions uh, during in the chat. And with that, I will turn it over to Parviz. Parviz, did we lose you? Are you still there? Yes, thank you, Erin. Um, and um, uh, for a second, it was kind of a disconnection, but we are back on. Uh, so what I want to talk about to it today is security is becoming more and more important for every aspect of our lives, and especially an enterprise uh, environment. And the reason for that is increasing cyber attacks. Um, in addition to that, we are seeing that cost of this type of attacks is increasing. So it's not only the frequency of it, but the cost of, the, um, cost of that is increasing. Estimated by 2031, probably we have um, a, a ransomware attack every two seconds. Uh, so this is really pushing us from an enterprise architecture perspective and infrastructure management to figure out how to deal with that. So we have been using software and application firewalls operating systems, hardening the BIOS firmware, and we are seeing this attack guard getting uh, deeper and deeper into our infrastructure. So before with the hard firewall, we could block many of it. Uh, but that's not the case today with cyber attack, ransomware, uh, and, and uh, adversarial attack, and et cetera. And this is why it's important we pay attention to security from multi-perspective, uh, uh, and uh, this is going to help us to reduce the surface attack. Probably we are not going to be completely uh, a containing the environment, but that's a conversation we have today, how we can reduce the surface attack and be able to deal with that. Uh, in the next slide uh, that I'm going to talk about, <clears throat> security is also a business imperative. If we take a look at this, um, customers are demanding it. Uh, as more hack and data breaches happening, customers are unhappy. And we are seeing more and more often email from different vendors that uh, uh, basically letting you know that your data is out in the in the dark side. And, and this is one is uh, one aspect of demanding my customer driving us to think about security in more holistic way and also very detailed. Uh, so government, uh, government and regulators are also looking at the, this uh, from a multiple perspective, from data privacy perspective, uh, and governments from uh, uh, basically national security perspective. And they are seeing that any information that can be 
concerned and uh, basically is stolen from different entities within a country could be used against the government uh, of United States, in this case, and any other governments worldwide. In addition to that, cloud leaders are driving this as well. Uh, as cloud migration from on-prem happening more frequently, and this is a trend going forward, that cloud vendor also paying attention to provide the security feature and capability that is differentiated value for them. So that's where this is a business imperative uh, rather than just technology decision making that we have been looking at it in the past. In the next slide that I will look into, uh, data protection is really driving this business opportunity as well. So in many cases, we are thinking about if we can offer new capability, security functionalities, capabilities, and features, then that becomes differentiated value to competitors. Uh, if one cloud vendor offer one uh, type of security versus the other, or one service provider uh, uh, providing additional security, uh, then this has become part of the offering to the customers uh, and differentiated value for them. Now we are seeing this is uh, the data protection become a fundamental requirement, as I said, from business perspective to regulate their to government. And uh, world data is gonna increase significantly as we are seeing here by 2025, about 61% year over year, that's massive. How do we protect this data? How do we protect the intellectual property, which is part of this data that we are talking about uh, and so forth. In addition to that, workload placement decision uh, factors also play an important role. We talk about uh, that regulation and compliance um, um, trust factors cost and complexity, zero trust security strategy. These are really key aspects of uh, why data protection is driving the business opportunities in addition to solving the data protection security issues combination together. Next slide, please. So protection data and, and coding use. What we've been having today uh, in most environment is that we have secure our data at rest in a storage encryption technology. We have uh, secure the data in transit, uh, moving between diff different uh, uh, basically uh, components or entities within an infrastructure via, via network encryption. Mm -hmm. So we have done that, but we are seeing the cyber attack is continuously rising. So we need to continue doing that. But in addition to that, we are seeing new attacks. And this is based on uh, new capabilities. So we do have new way of processing data, new way of analyzing data, a new way of building our application environment that open up the door for um, a different uh, attack vectors. So data in use is one of the newest attack vector that hackers and attackers are looking into. And that compromise on when you run your application, it is completely open and, um, uh, in, in an um, uh, in-process environment. So it's been uh, unencrypted and it's been processed within the CPU environment and system memory combination. And that's where the attack vectors are focusing on going forward. So to preventing that, we have a technology that is based on what we call trusted execution environment. So we create an environment um, uh, and this environment providing, providing at most security for runtime of the application environment, runtime for model, and uh, if you are the, talking about from an AI perspective, when you run your model and, and execute on that, they are will be executed within the uh, trust the execution environment that based on two vectors, you have unencrypted data, you have encrypted result, and using this environment with isolation and attestation features that is available to, uh, through the T uh, technology based on different vendor offering, and we secure the environment. I'll get to a little bit more detail about this and showing the flow of that in the next slide. And uh, this is where we believe <clears throat> Uh, that um, rethink the way trust works. 
this is what we, we believe traditional traditional change of trust works on chaining different type of securities. However, the problem with that is we still have actors that they, they can have access to confidential data. Then you have a VMM, and you have system administrative, you have cloud administrative. They are part of what we call trust, uh, trust boundaries. And trust boundaries, it's where anyone in those trust boundaries or any components of the environment can access the confidential data. So with the confidential computing chain of trust, what we are doing is we are removing many of these actors such as OS, VMM, and BIOS, um, which is system administrative and VM administrative uh, outside of the boundary trust boundaries. So on the right-hand side here, you're seeing that there is a chain of trust built from uh, hardware, uh, root of trust. We verify the hardware and confidentiality and integrity of the hardware first, and then we chain that information with software that running in a trusted environment. And we are removing OS, VMM, and BIOS from that trust boundaries. And that's really fundamental concept of confidential computing using and a trusted execution environment. Uh, one thing I want to mention in here, this is also fundamental to zero trust strategy. Uh, so with this, we are not trusting additional actors in our environment. We are reducing it significantly. In the next slide, we'll get into um, talking about where this technology could be actually useful. So in multi-part, and, and these are not actually limited to every scenarios. These are highest uh, top scenarios that we have seen so far and extending beyond that. So multi-party sharing scenarios is where data usage is without exposing, the, um, you can use the data without exposing underlying data to other parties. This is very important when uh, you want to share data between multiple parties let's say within a financial services environment, uh, data sharing is one of the areas that is been growing because of the need for, uh, uh, for example, one is open banking in, in Europe. Uh, the um, uh, insurance companies wants to share data with each other to be able to have a better understanding of their environment when it comes to fraud detection, financial crime, and so forth. Uh, so that's one scenario that we are talking about. The second one is moving the sensitive workload to manage infrastructure in the cloud. So how do you attest the integrity and confidentiality of data and code when you are moving it to the cloud? Uh, can you just trust the environment by itself or should be uh, adding additional layer of uh, security capabilities at the station integrity uh, capabilities that ensure that your data and code is going to be safe. Removing the infrastructure owners. So even removing the cloud owners. So cloud owners cannot see your data if you are using this technology via the confidential computing. And this allow you to trust the environment even more beyond what uh, normal trust is being developed and on security layers is being built in the cloud service environment. And the lastly is hardware enforced isolation uh, from other tenants. So it's not only providing uh, you uh, with a confidential environment, but also uh, isolating you uh, with the hardware capability, not just the software uh, from other a tenant within an environment. And that's really the maximum we can offer from hardware all the way to uh, attestation of the services and confidentiality of the data and code. And the last scenario that I talked about is talking about workload with a high privacy, security, and regulatory requirement. Uh, in financial services, there are many aspects that uh, meet this requirement. Uh, so if you are touching any uh, PII data, uh, uh, personally, uh, personally identifying uh, uh, basically information uh, that's most sensitive for all of the financial services, healthcare, industries, government, and so forth. Uh, this will be protected via the T uh, environment and confidential computing infrastructure uh, beyond traditional security solution that we are using today. Uh, and this really 
uh, pushing us to the next step of talking about, which I will cover in the next slide, uh, what else that is coming up that accelerating uh, the adoption of confidential computing environment. Uh, those uses that I've been talking about, they are around for last five, six years and is expanding uh, within that group. But we are seeing that rise of uh, AI use cases uh, uh, really calling for a confidential environment that we can run AI type algorithms and codes uh, with utmost security. And this is what we call it, the need for confidential AI. Uh, and industries are seeing it more. We are seeing it in financial services, in healthcare, in government. I'm sure this is gonna be expanding across as the AI becoming embedded into every aspect of our operational perspective, just a normal living um, uh, and, and uh, uh, any aspect that we are uh, in, uh, interacting with customers. Uh, so confidential AI, it's a solution that we're going to talk about in more detail. Um, and uh, But before we get to do that, let me talk about other aspects and how this confidential AI is going to able to secure entire um, uh, basically flow of uh, AI operation in the next slide. So we are seeing that chat GPT is one of the latest family of AI is gaining significant traction. That's basically is on fire. Everybody talking about it, every industry is looking at it to how they can take advantage of it. Uh, that's a great technology. It's going to be prominent and moving forward, embedded into many aspects of our, our life. Uh, but the problem is every time we are coming up with the new technologies, new capabilities, we are offering, uh, we are also bringing uh, new surface attack that is not being tested before. And chat GPT is, is nothing different than other technologies, but because of ex um, uh, extended uh, basically usage of chat GPT that can be applied to many uh, aspects of um, enterprise environment and consumer environment combination, open up many doors. One of the newest one surface attack, for example, is prompt injection. So when you run, write in a prompt uh, by a malicious attackers, they can actually inject a specific prompting that uh, cause the system to reveal uh, confidential data. Very similar to what we had in the past with SQL injection problem, this could happen with chat GP type environment. But this is not the only aspect of it, it's beyond that. So let's take a look at the whole flow in the next slide. So if we're looking at the uh, AI and uh, traditional ML uh, data flow, uh, it starts with data, then we develop a model, then we deploy a model. During every aspect of this today, the data is exposed. It's not fully encrypted. Um, uh, if it is moving between different aspects of the infrastructure, that could be to the networking that we have talked about before encryption. But beyond that, when you are trying to actually prep in data, uh, normalizing it and, and op operating, uh, basically processing it, the data is at open. When you are operating and running your model, that is also in open. And so forth, when you get to inference and deployment perspective, uh, we don't have that... Uh, great security infrastructure in place to manage all of that. Therefore, running the entire operation in a confidential environment is essential to moving forward in, in adopting different type of AI technologies, including large language model and chat GPT that becoming the key factor of um, all of all of our environments. And this is where we will talk about uh, the confidential AI infrastructures, how T, hardware-based T, play important role in this, and how um, basically you should consider this level of security for your AI environment. Let's look at the next slide and uh, talking about the confidential AI in practice. This is where Richard, my friend, is going to talk about in more detail how a trusted uh, execution environment in practice can help 
running AI, end-to-end AI uh, processes in a confidential environment. Richard? Yeah, thank you, Pavis. That's, that's a great introduction to the technology and the, the need for it today. So what does this look like in practice? Well, <clears throat> there are several considerations that need to be taken into account when thinking about deploying confidential AI. And what we're looking at here is some of those uh, key characteristics that any technology needs to provide, uh, and also how that technology needs to accommodate that end-to-end uh, AI um, pipeline lifecycle that Parvis was uh, mentioning in his remarks. So we've talked about ChatGPT already, hundreds of millions of users, uh, and also even within a, a discrete organizational setting, uh, systems need to be able to scale to meet the flexibility of user demand uh, and also to accommodate the volumes of data that need to be processed to develop the sophisticated models we want to use today. So essentially, this needs to be deployable on a, a hassle-free uh, SaaS um, infrastructure. It has to be available uh, on a global basis. And also, there has to be the ability to use trusted execution environments equally well within an on-premises setting where you might want to control uh, access to data in training uh, in order to meet organizational compliance requirements. And confidential computing now provides that capability with the hardware platforms that support trusted execution environments today. And equally, once you have that infrastructure in place, you need to have ease of access to the data necessary to build those models. And also the ability to protect that data once it's being used in training and, and also the intellectual property associated with uh, the outcome model from the, the training cycle. I'm sure there's many people in the audience that are uh, closely following developments in the AI industry with regard to regulation. Uh, those in the US may have seen uh, just last Friday, the White House published a, a set of voluntary commitments that many of the major companies in generative AI development uh, subscribe to. And actually, uh, the third of those commitments related to security uh, requires that the uh, weights and biases associated with models are protected, uh, and that forms that intellectual property of the model. And trusted execution environments represent uh, an effective technology that's available today to do this. And we'll, we'll talk about why in just a second. We also need to be able to provide um, auditability of the use of data. Um, and in particular, where we're seeing things like the EU AI Act, it's going to be necessary uh, for companies to demonstrate how they've used data, protected copyrights, addressed consents where they're using uh, personal information. And the auditability that's provided by attestation of trusted execution environments enables a record of the use of data and the use of models uh, for demonstration to um, compliance and governance teams uh, and also industry regulators. But just as important as the uh, technical implementation, what's also essential is that the uh, solution should support the types of AI frameworks that are familiar to the data scientists that are using uh, these technologies in an unsecured way today. And so you need broad framework support for things like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, and you need to be able to port models into this confidential AI environment using uh, uh, systems and technologies such as Onyx and PMML format models so that you can take your existing code and deploy it seamlessly into the, the trusted execution environment. So on the right hand side of this slide, what we can see is how a trusted execution environment can be built on a compatible hardware. And this enables the running of models for training and inference in the same way that they would perform natively, because essentially it's the same code, but running in a protected memory region on the hardware. Uh, and this enables you to uh, effectively deploy workloads, validate workloads, and also make them accessible through APIs to client services uh, that want to use them for inference. And this is the, the essential ingredient to providing a, a confidential AI scenario. In practice, what a secure enclave is doing is providing uh, a trusted execution environment as an isolated region of memory uh, using both isolation and attestation, as uh, Parvis mentioned in his, uh, his remarks. And that isolation prevents any access, as he said, from the host operating systems, virtual machine managers, cloud admins, or peer applications using the same compute infrastructure. 
And the advantage of the integrity guarantees that are provided by confidential AI are that you can effectively evaluate the AI uh, code that's being used to process data before that data is sent. And also encrypted data can be sent to the trusted execution environment and only decrypted at runtime within the uh, safe provisions of that trusted execution environment. Using uh, transport layer security that terminates in the trusted execution environment, it's also then possible to connect those client services uh, using secure communication so that if you have your data encrypted at rest with um, either encryption or tokenize, tokenization technologies to provide data anonymization, with this uh, availability of confidential computing today, you can provide full data lifecycle security <clears throat> with auditability for regulators and, and governance professionals. Uh, and this is a key capability of confidential computing that isn't available with other technologies that are being experimented with for uh, the use of multi-party multi multi -party computation and AI deployment. Uh, confidential computing with its attestation mechanism is the only way to provide the integrity guarantees necessary to validate workloads before uh, they're actually operated on. So let's talk about where this is being used today uh, within industry. We'll talk about some generic use cases, and then we'll talk about some more specific examples of how the technology has been implemented successfully uh, and the benefits that are gained by those customers using it. So as Parviz mentioned, there are three principal industry verticals where we're seeing uh, adoption of confidential AI uh, across government, financial services, and healthcare. And there are some specific reasons for these verticals uh, leading the way with adoption of this technology. In the government space, we're obviously dealing with examples of very sensitive and classified information. Uh, and also there's a need for regulators to process data that's been gathered from independent sources and to do that securely without uh, breaching any of the covenants associated with use of that data. And obviously, uh, governments have access to um, population data uh, that contains information related to healthcare, criminal records, etc. Uh, and this it's important that this information is processed securely uh, and that analytics tools and AI systems that are involved in the analysis of that data um, do that in a secure and, and safe way um, under the provisions of regulations and legislation. In financial services, the same things apply. It's a heavily regulated industry, and there are specific covenants that apply to financial institutions in terms of how they use data, what data can be exchanged between different teams within those institutions, and how data needs to be isolated between institutions to prevent uh, collusion and, um, uh, and unfair comp competitive practices. And we'll see an example of that when we come on to a real world use case. We've seen well, Richard, specific- if you yeah. don't mind, um, I had one on a global data in here. And so I've been involved with money laundering project uh, using federated learning, for example, digital currencies, uh, using uh, blockchain technologies uh, that has this core uh, capability of um, T environment. Uh, what we are seeing, people are trying to address the data well security from different perspective, for example, using in specifically in AI um, uh, development, using synthetic data, which is fantastic. That's great for model development to certain point, but synthetic data cannot replace actual data. This is what we offer with the security that right people can access the right data within the T environment with all of the security features that we talk about. So although you might be thinking using synthetic data, which you should, but runtime environment in production and, and then actual testing of your model on the, uh, on the data, that's really uh, an area that confidential AI is going to provide for you uh, beyond what we just talked about up to this point. Back yeah, to you, Richard. Yeah, thanks, Pavis. That's, that's a really great point. And uh, in terms of ensuring model accuracy for some of these these essential um, application use cases, that that ability to process real data is, is is absolutely critical. And the other thing is that what we're seeing across both financial services and healthcare is interaction of services with the the end consumer, be it the patient or the account holder. And obviously those exchanges themselves need to be protected in terms of the information that's being transferred either between doctors with things like telemedicine 
or um, requests for uh, account details and payments and, and transfers uh, by the account owner in, in a banking context. But in healthcare, there are obvious benefits from the use of AI. Uh, we've seen uh, developments in drug discovery, uh, utilization for epidemiology through the COVID-19 pandemic, contact tracing, for example, is something I'm sure we all remember, uh, and also the management of electronic health records, which are becoming increasingly prevalent in uh, a variety of different uh, jurisdictions. Uh, and so healthcare is also one of the pioneers of this technology, and, and we'll talk about a specific use case that has some, some very real benefits for the, uh, the healthcare ecosystem. So in banking, one example of the use of the technology here uh, is based on isolation of the data for analysis between different uh, jurisdictions. In this case, data sourced within Switzerland that needs to be uh, used to provide a detailed analysis for the, the parent bank in the United States. And in Switzerland, there are very stringent banking regulations uh, that prohibit disclosure of private customer information to third parties. And that actually includes uh, other divisions of the bank and, and bank personnel that aren't located in Switzerland. So this has to be handled uh, very carefully and there has to be uh, demonstrable auditability of how data has actually been deployed. So with the attestation service uh, that's available with confidential computing, you can validate the actual machine uh, on which the data has been processed. Um, and that can include a geographic tag to provide data sovereignty um, uh, credentials. And equally, permission controls can be uh, initiated over data to ensure that only applications or human analysts that have uh, um, permission to view the data can actually access it or process the, uh, the requests for analysis. So here, uh, what we're able to do is to serve encrypted data to the trusted execution environment, verify the integrity of the application that's being deployed there, and then actually control who has access to data and report that based on the uh, attestation credentials, which are uh, cryptographically verifiable by uh, a third party. So uh, an important use case and, and also one that is the foundation for other work that's been done in, in fields like genetics, for example, uh, in the healthcare domain. In the government sector, there's obviously um, a variety of applications in both civilian government uh, and also uh, within the military and defense context. In this case, uh, what we're looking at is the use of um, confidential computing to provide a confidential AI environment that provides that full life cycle capability that Parv has mentioned. So it begins with training, in this case on synthetic data, which uh, was chosen because of the uh, limited availability of real world satellite data to train a sophisticated model. But then once that model has been trained, it then needs to be used for inference over real world satellite data. And in this case, the um, use case was to uh, detect aircraft of a secure object detection and then to classify those aircraft according to their particular role characteristics. And here we're put, placing the model inside the trusted execution environment using the PyTorch uh, framework to deploy our AI workload, serving the encrypted data that's drawn from the satellite imagery into that trusted execution environment using AI to detect those aircraft and classify them and categorize their role and then encrypting those results for uh, use by uh, a downstream application. And what's important here is the ability to follow that full uh, cradle to grave life cycle of the model uh, and to deploy again using those frameworks that are familiar to AI developers so that there's no difference uh, in uh, deployment and function of the model between the trusted execution environment and their uh, unsecured use today. Equally, what we might want to do with AI uh, deployments is to actually control the uh, access to data and to um, ensure that we demonstrate compliance with regulations when the system is actually being deployed. And here we see a use case that's using computer vision to detect objects within the visual frame. But there's information within this uh, visual field that we want to obscure and obfuscate uh, for privacy reasons, such as the number plates on the vehicles, faces of pedestrians, 
And this would be representatives of scenarios used in things like traffic control and also within autonomous vehicles, which are becoming increasingly prevalent, where uh, the autonomous capability is derived from the sensor packages that are monitoring the environment, specifically using computer vision and uh, conveying that information back to the um, master control unit of the vehicle and also for analytics by the, um, the manufacturer. So trusted execution environments are, are actually providing enablement not only within data center scenarios, but also now in uh, edge scenarios where data has to be processed locally uh, and it has to be demonstrated that that's been done in a safe way. And again, using the attestation of the workload um, for auditability, it's possible to demonstrate that that system is secure and safe and also protect the integrity of the AI workload against adversarial attacks and corruption by um, a cyber attacker that might be trying to access the, the underlying hardware um, in order to uh, um, uh, retrieve data or change the uh, performance of the model. So some real world use cases that are actually out in the field today, uh, we'll start on the left hand side in the healthcare domain. And uh, I mentioned the use of this technology for clinical AI validation. And this is uh, particularly important because of the nature of the data associated with healthcare in the United States, it's governed by HIPAA um, privacy and security rules. Uh, and it's also subject in the EU to uh, EU GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation uh, covenants. Uh, those are extraterritorial, so they apply to EU citizens wherever that data is used. And what this solution provides is the ability for an AI developer to validate the performance of their model for a particular purpose. It might be um, to diagnose specific diseases, or it might be to evaluate the effects of potential drugs on um, real world patients. Uh, and they can use uh, real data uh, rather than synthetic data as Parvez alluded to in the finance domain to validate that AI model uh, without compromising the privacy <coughs> of the uh, data that's hosted by a healthcare provider. And again, uh, consents can be demonstrated using the uh, permission sets over the, the data set uh, before that's decrypted in order to run that against the model. There are several advantages here. Not only is this protecting the healthcare data and ensuring compliance with data protection regulations, what it's also doing in uh, consistent with the uh, voluntary uh, commitments that were uh, set down with the White House last week is it's protecting those model weights and biases that are actually the intellectual property of the AI developer and the source of their uh, potential forward revenue. And this has uh, benefits for us as a society because what it's doing is it's accelerating the um, uh, federal approval of AI algorithms for deployment uh, for therapeutic use within the healthcare domain and compressing not only the time to market, but also the cost associated with use of the data. And typically that could roll um, into uh, millions of dollars uh, in terms of the uh, cost of accessing data and demonstrating compliance with the, the different contractual characteristics necessary to use real world data. And this can be handled and managed using uh, a confidential AI system to ensure protection of both the model and the data um, so that each party is mutually assured of the security of their information. So this uh, has um, inevitable benefits, both in terms of the number of uh, medicinal and clinical applications of AI, but also the uh, cost to the healthcare system that uh, we as consumers effectively pay for. And in the middle, uh, um, Parvez mentioned about uh, the use of uh, systems for, for financial crime prevention. Um, a paper was presented last year at the IEEE Big Data Conference in Osaka, Japan. It's reference one at the bottom of the slide, setting out a reference architecture for uh, anti-money laundering using a technique called federated machine learning, where host data uh, at individual banks that can't be shared is used to build a globally optimized model uh, effectively to uh, pattern match and understand where transactions might be fraudulent or, or where potential financial crimes uh, uh, can be detected in the uh, transactions between different accounts either within individual banks or between banks 
And this is uh, particularly important, again, because of the scale of the fraud and also the need to avoid uh, false positives, which eventually uh, contribute to uh, cost in terms of the uh, use of the system and negative customer effects in terms of the um, uh, stopping of transactions. So this is an important use case. It demonstrates how TEEs or trusted execution environments across heterogeneous infrastructure and being used by uh, different organizations can be brought into a common uh, solution that has benefits for each of the parties. And rather than sharing data, we're now uh, talking about the use of data in data collaborations with confidential AI, mm -hmm. because the data isn't actually exchanged between any of the parties. And obviously there are regulatory benefits in terms of the potential oversight of uh, anti-money laundering applications between different institutions. And then finally, following on from the use case we've already discussed, um, uh, the paper references at the bottom is reference to, in addition to uh, secure object detection and validation from satellite imagery, the same system using the standard uh, YOLO v5 uh, version 6 uh, algorithm that many uh, here might be familiar with, was used with transfer learning in order to adapt uh, that system from detecting just uh, aircraft but also then to be able to train and detect the weapon systems that are located within the visual field. And this shows the type of flexibility and capability that can be realized with confidential AI in order to adapt AI models from third party providers or open source uh, libraries in order to suit specific purposes. And this again comes back to the use of um, technology, not only within the cloud, but within an on premises environment in order to do local training on your discrete data in a secure and verifiable manner. So uh, three real world use cases that have used confidential AI deployments with confidential computing and that demonstrate not only the power of this solution to uh, provide secure and safe AI systems, but also their scalability to, to very large real world use cases with um, significant amounts of data. So with that, um, I think we're ready for some questions. Yes. And so please, uh, as a reminder, you can ask questions by selecting the ask question option and entering your questions. And we did have a couple questions come through. Uh, we have a two part question, which is, uh, can you please give us a picture of the upcoming standards for strengthening security? And do you believe that the EU AI Act is going to the right direction and it will have an impact to the industry? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So. Uh... One of the, the roles that I fulfill is I'm part of the NIST public working group on generative AI in the United States. And as we've seen, the draft EU AI Act uh, was approved in June by the European Parliament. But just last week, um, in a debate at the UN Security Council, there were also calls to um, provide international regulation in the same way that we have uh, treaties and conventions on things like arms control and human rights, etc. So... I think what we're going to see is different nation states taking uh, discrete approaches. Um, I live in the UK and that's taken a, a much more open approach to AI regulation in order to, uh, in theory, stimulate innovation and uh, avoid restrictions on uh, the development path for AI. The EU already has obviously very prescriptive data protection regulation that we, we've mentioned today. And so the EU AI Act takes a similar approach. It's quite prescriptive and it's designed to complement data privacy uh, regulations that already exist. As each uh, country sort of takes its own approach, I think what's going to be interesting to see is um, how security and data privacy feature in different jurisdictions. Um, one of the interesting things is that there's quite a lot of debate already today about how these massive generative AI systems have used data scraped from the web and whether things like copyright provisions have been um, acknowledged and whether data privacy of subjects in imagery from social media, for example, has been respected. And I think at an international level, it's going to be interesting to see whether, uh, first of all, people can agree on a cohesive framework to regulate AI and not just leave it up to the, the companies involved under voluntary codes, such as we saw published on Friday. Uh, and equally, if that code uh, can be formed through collective agreement, 
whether uh, everybody will sign up to it, whether certain countries will abstain, uh, and also whether the time taken to develop that legislation um, isn't superseded by uh, technological developments in, in AI. You know, we, we saw uh, ChatGPT proved very disruptive last year, and I think, you know, it'd be interesting to see if there are further disruptive uh, technical releases by the, the major developers in the next couple of years as they, they vie for, for market share. So. Um, I think it's an open question, really, what direction AI regulation will go at an international level. But I think certainly people need to be aware of how it applies within the, the particular regions in which they operate and where models are sourced from and how data is used. And another thing I want to add into that, uh, what Richard already um, talked about, is regulators. So regulators in the last four or five years uh, are um, becoming more open working with financial institution to understand the impact of adopting new technologies such as AI in general and generative AI to be specific. Uh, and this combination of regulators and financial institution, at least in this space of uh, FSI, uh, it's creating momentum. Um, uh, regulators such as Monetary Authority of Singapore, they are leading the uh, uh, this this strategy and direction, working very actively with vendors, understanding the technology. They create their own internal AI team, etc. Uh, so they understand the technology application of that within the financial services and, and uh, how to guide uh, rest of the banking institute that they are directly working with. And so I think combination of government uh, uh, vendors, uh, regulators, uh, and industry it's going to be able to come up with guidance on how to move forward uh, with not only creation, but adoption as well as um, uh, continuous development and innovation within the area. So that, that's something that we, we need to take a look at it. Having said that, I wanna uh, mention that majority of financial institutions that I work with, they ban the use of generative AI within their environment as is today due to significant uh, security threat and as well as the, the areas that is unknown. And so this type of activity happening very quickly. I think the general guidance is going to be helpful, uh, but combination of vendors and industry and, and regulator can provide very precise um, uh, guidance in terms of adoption of this type of technology uh, and innovation within that space. Great. And there is another question here. Uh, what is your favorite reference for implementing the confidential computing that bypasses the OS, BIOS, VMM, and uses the root trust certificate? Yeah, that's a that's a great question too. And um, you know, respecting the the vendor neutrality um, uh, within SNEER, I think it's important to to know that there are different implementations of trusted execution environments, and they they're very relevant to to different types of purposes. So, for example, you have process-based trusted execution environments. <clears throat> Some of you will be familiar with a, a technology called uh, Intel Software Guard Extensions, which is a process-based implementation. And what that enables is very discreet uh, definition of a trusted execution environment, which you might want to use where you have the ability to write specific code and to uh, protect very sensitive information because of the of the isolation um, from things like the hypervisor and virtual machine manager. There are also uh, different technologies available now uh, that have a, a virtualization basis and they include a guest operating system within their trusted computing base, but they provide um, greater flexibility in terms of implementation. So you might want to use that, for example, um, uh, where you have, uh, for example, um, uh, larger applications or you want to have a, a more complex deployment um, and typically I think this is where we're going to see applications of things like large language models because of the types of services that we're going to want to connect to them so there's a variety of different technologies out there one thing that you might want to do is to engage with uh, the Linux Foundation's Confidential Computing Consortium which is another vendor neutral organization which has uh, some good direction on the, the technologies that now support or confidential AI. Uh, so one thing uh, that um, uh, Richard, uh, again, following what you said, is uh, a guidance in terms of what is the right approach, what technology and, and so forth, uh, is that understanding that 
what level of confidentiality that you require, you are required to deliver. Based on that, make a decision. Because as I talked about, each of these technology, whether on a virtual environment or coming from hardware base all the way to the bottom, uh, is that uh, removing uh, or limiting the trust boundaries. So who you don't want to see that data and uh, as, as you're looking to that saying that is that virtual uh, machine manager, network admin, OS admin, uh, cloud service provider admin or others. Uh, so you look at the boundaries, trust boundaries that you are building and the level of confidentiality uh, that you need to de- deliver. Therefore, you can kind of uh, make a sense of that. You can also uh, freely contact me and Richard and others uh, that uh, focus on this environment to help you out if you're interested. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, continue, please. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I can probably pick up the question from um, Paige in, in the chat as well about uh, differences sure. in terms of implementation. So, uh, again, I mentioned the Confidential Computing Consortium, which is the uh, sort of generic industry body representing uh, trusted execution environment technologies and uh, covering use cases such as confidential AI. What's important there with regard to the trust model, and I'll, I'll come back to, you know, Parviz, who mentioned about the need for a, a different model of how trust works. One of the critical things about confidential computing is that the definition provided by the confidential computing consortium includes the, the, the need for an attested trusted execution environment. So in order to have that uh, reassurance of confidentiality and the isolation and integrity guarantees that we spoke about, attestation is really what I would call the ground truth of confidential computing and and absolutely necessary. So in any uh, secure implementation of confidential AI, that attestation provides the assurance that you're working in that protected memory region data can be uh, secured and encrypted in memory and that the AI workload itself is shielded from the other uh, elements of the computing system that Parviz mentioned on his earlier slide. So I don't know, Parviz, whether you want to just make some remarks on that. Uh, yeah, so, so in general, um, as I mentioned, that the, uh, the, the technology that you are targeting to use uh, will provide certain level of capabilities. Uh, and if you're starting from hardware-based technology, then you have the utmost security capability that you can get. That means removing majority of actors outside of the boundary of your trust. So you are only limit that to an a application that is running in a trusted executed environment can have access to confidential data. So you're removing everybody else out of that equation. So this is gave you the utmost security capabilities. However, this also uh, creating level of isolation that you might not want to use for a type of application doesn't need this level of security. So balance the need for utmost security and a more relaxed security environment based on your risk appetite. And that will be also in another gauging saying that what is your risk appetite? What is your SLA in delivering the security and confidentiality? And the technologies that we are offering cover both uh, from multiple vendors on a virtual environment, separate attestation capabilities, what we call independent attestation, third party independent attestation capability, even on top of uh, the environment we are building. Uh, So uh, there are a number of areas that confidential computing with a different level of capability can help you guys out to deal with this challenge. And so um, I think we have time just for one last question. Uh, With compute capabilities on edge increasing, how do you see trusted execution environment evolving? Yeah, that's that's another great question. So um, one of the important things about confidential computing is that um, it's Although it's a, a discrete privacy enhancing technology, the fact is it's part of the underlying compute hardware that, that everything's now built from. So we're seeing this become a ubiquitous capability, not only uh, within data centers, as I, as I mentioned, but also at the edge. And the edge is going to be increasingly important as we, we look ahead to things like 6G uh, communication networks. And we've already seen in critical infrastructure uh, deployments how confidential computing can protect uh, isolated um, 
uh, equipment uh, within a, a, an operational technology scenario. So one of the things that I see moving forward with uh, confidential AI is not only the very large models and the huge uh, data processing capabilities of centralized services, whether they be within organizations or, or within the cloud through um, service APIs, but I also see a role for AI at the edge in terms of things like signal processing, um, data quality evaluation, uh, particularly where that data is being sourced from different endpoints. And uh, there are instances where uh, this technology has been demonstrated in edge use cases, um, not only within um, uh, federated machine learning in the uh, finance uh, sector, but also um, uh, within healthcare. And in fact, uh, um, uh, I published a, a paper just recently in the Journal of Data uh, Protection and Privacy on the use of the technology in the Internet of Medical Things, showing a layered approach to uh, deployment of AI uh, and how confidential computing can support that trust chain that Harv has alluded to. So I think very soon we're going to see uh, confidential computing at the edge integrated with confidential computing at the center to provide full coverage of those uh, critical systems and, and also uh, validation of data provenance in terms of where it's sourced from edge devices. And, and, and as uh, generative AI type technology um, advances going forward, especially chat GPT type technologies, we are seeing uh, inference is going to happen at the edge. Today, um, I'm obviously training happening in cloud or data centers, uh, inference happening in cloud and data centers, but we will see growth of edge devices that they run inference model at the edge. And the, the security technologies we talk about, especially when it comes to attestation, uh, play a significant role in securing that environment. Great. And so to everybody, uh, for more information about confidential AI, there are some links here in the presentation, which can also be downloaded. And thank you for uh, viewing this webinar. You can also rate this presentation, and that's important to us as it gives us a solid indication of whether or not we are delivering the right quality of content. Thank you, Parviz and Richard, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Great to talk to you today. Thank you.